All right. There it is. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to welcome you from the parish hall. I'm trying to act like we were in church right now and you sauntered down the hallway and retrieved your coffee and donut. And now you're here at the Canterbury House. Uh, my name is Jeremiah, otherwise known as Deacon Jeremiah. And it is my delight and privilege to um, introduce Jenny Shute, who has been at our church for three years. We were just talking about how long Jenny and um, her husband Dave have been with us. Jenny is, um, well, I, I knew Jenny first as just an accomplished artist, um, self-taught, and she's been painting her entire life. And I've just always admired how she's engaged with the things of God through her painting. I like to talk a lot about kind of the, the full integration of faith in one's life. And Jenny really models that in her artwork. Um, I see a disciple of Jesus in her artwork. I see someone who's very attentive to the things of God in what she does. So it's just been a delight to converse with her and plan this seminar for you and to kind of tour the work that she's done over the years. Um, Jenny, before I turn, uh, I was going to say the microphone, but the, the video feed to you, the Zoom feed, I also wanted just to announce to each one of you that Anna Chase, Anna, can you wave to everyone? Anna Chase, yes, there's Anna Chase. Anna Chase um, is our new curator of the Canterbury House. Uh, she studies, what are you studying at Northwest University? psych major i psych can't remember major. if i'm i have a specific route i think i'm just general psych but no hoping one. to be a counselor so all right so maybe you can do a seminar on bentham's panopticon and what this is all doing to us psychologically on zoom <laughs> that would be great um but no it's been a delight working with anna here at northwest and um her interests kind of are beautifully tied to the work we're doing here and the ministry we're doing at the canterbury house Anna is gonna be um, the curator in the sense that she's gonna helm the waiting room and the chat uh, because I'm just, I'm just driven to distraction when I see that panel right here of everyone coming in and I'm trying to converse with you and connect with you. So uh, that's a thank you, Anna, for doing that for us. I really appreciate it. Anna is also gonna be doing some work uh, thinking about how we can incorporate more social media with the Canterbury House in a way that um, is just above my pay grade and my generation. So, <laughs> so I'm really grateful for your expertise and uh, thank you, Anna. It'll be wonderful to be a, a co-conspirator with you here at the Canterbury House as our curator. All right, well, I'm gonna open us with prayer and then uh, Jenny, uh, thank you for being here and thank you for leading us through this tour uh, where you're taking us into the museum of your work and I love it. Let's pray together, everyone. Heavenly Father, I thank you that this is the day that you have made. And I pray that we would rejoice and be glad in it um, as we think about the role of art in the life of the believer, uh, an art that is attentive to the beauty of the world and the beauty of your truth um, and the way that you are manifestly active in the world that you have made in the hearts of people. So thank you for Jenny. I thank you for her life and witness and thank you for uh, the privilege it is to be in this company together. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, you, my turn, huh? All right, so this is called God Paintings, Weaving Together Color, Shape, and Symbolism to Reflect Jesus. Um, I have loved painting an artistic expression for as long as I can remember. I've also loved God from my earliest memories. A little over 10 years ago, these two loves came together. I was sitting in church and a vision for a series of three paintings depicting the connection between the Last Supper, Jesus on the cross, and taking communion popped into my mind's eye. So I'm going to start my little slideshow so you can see what happened, what I came up with. There we go. So here is the result of um, that vision. It started out, I first saw it as uh, full faces and everything. And then it, uh, it developed into using hands to represent Jesus as he passed out the Passover bread and wine to the disciples. Then his hand on the cross with the wine, which wine slash blood uh, pouring out and going into the cup that we take when we have communion. My dad graciously agreed to be my very first hand model 
And uh, that was amazing because I've always loved his hands. He worked with wood, he was a carpenter. So they were the perfect hands. And he also helped me brainstorm how to do it initially with the hand on the cross, which is actually a leaf from our dining room table uh, for the wood. Um, I just was, I just couldn't deal with the idea of putting a nail, even if it was just painted. And so my dad said, well, what about the cup? And I'll just tip it this way. And um, it actually worked out perfectly because it ties everything together. Uh, it helps me be more engaged with the bread and the wine when I picture Jesus offering it to me like he did with the disciples. Around the outside are the words that Jesus spoke about the new covenant that fulfilled the prophecy in Jeremiah. Uh, and it sort of ties everything together. So it says, the new covenant in my blood, my body broken, and my blood shed for you. Do this and remember me. So this is just kind of my little introductory page here. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit more about my process, then I'll share. Um, I have three different sets of paintings that I'm calling manifestations of God because they're about God and who he is. Next week, I'll be talking about uh, our relationship with God and different aspects of that. Uh, since I painted the initial painting, God has given me ideas for many other paintings that tell stories reflecting who he is. Some of them have become actual paintings and some of them have been gifts to me that are just tucked away and may or may not develop into anything more. Most often the concepts are sudden revelations that get refined as I think, pray, and talk with other people about them. Many times I'm sitting in church, I'm reading scripture or praying when it happens. And it usually is just like, boom, instant. Um, but I've also been inspired when I'm on a walk or I'm driving in the car. Once we are back at church in person, if you see me scribbling madly on a bulletin, it's probably another painting idea because it often happens uh, just kind of suddenly like that. And if I don't write it down, I don't always remember it. Uh, creating a painting is very much like having a baby for me. From the conception of the idea to the growing of the imagery to a labor that could be relatively brief and easy or very long and painful. Then finally, the delivery of a fully formed piece of art. Every time it is a form of miracle that increases my amazement at what God can do in and through me. Uh, let's see, I already said this part. Uh, <laughs> so I will describe the process and meaning for a piece of artwork. And then we'll pause for any questions or comments that you might have before moving on to the next one. So the first one is called Three in One, God with us. It represents the Trinity as much as we can represent the Trinity. Uh, I first pictured it as, a, as stacked square canvases. I described it to Dave, my husband, and he suggested that uh, having them on circles would show the in infinite nature of God. And uh, I liked that idea. And then I found some canvases with beveled edges. So they actually curve into one another, which makes the flow and the unity a lot better. So the sizes of the canvases get progressively smaller as they go from the vastness of the father to the more limited God man of Jesus on earth to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in individuals. As they stack on top of each other, they get closer to the viewer visually, which represents God coming closer to us as it, he moves from Father to Holy Spirit. The circles interact in their harmonious unity, 
yet have their unique aspects at the same time. I use the red, blue, purple, and white colors of the tabernacle, um, the temple veil, uh, in each image to reflect the holiness of the Trinity, as well as being representative of worship. Each canvas is divided into three sections to continue the Trinity theme. So we'll look at them one at a time. Um, they are actually glued together now, but I have a friend who photographs them and she took pictures of them one at a time. So here is the father and creator image. So the blue heavens are immense and vast and filled with God's creative nature and indicate the father's omnipresence. When God the Father appears in the Bible, it is in the form of clouds and fire. For example, in Exodus, when he led the Israelites with pillars of clouds and fire, at the giving of the law to Moses on the mountain, filling the tabernacle with his presence in the form of a cloud, and at the transfiguration of Jesus. And I'm sure there are more. Uh, I've never painted fire before, so I watched a video by Mural Joe, who is one of my favorite instructors online. Uh, he does all sorts of different things and I've, I've learned a lot from him. Uh, and then I just had a lot of fun playing around with the colors and shapes of the flames. So this one uh, is the God man son of Jesus. I decided to paint hands to show Jesus since he lived on earth in human form. First, the baby hand reaching up from the swaddling clothes, which represents the incarnation, God being made incarnate. Painting the little infant hand using pictures of my friend's grandson. Uh, she just gave me a whole collection and uh, I just love this one with all the little dimples and everything. It was very fun to paint. Next, my nephew Cody provided his hand as the model of Jesus' adult-sized hands. I took a bunch of photos when we were together at his church in Colorado when I was there visiting my family, including a couple of his hand in front of the cross that was on the wall there. Jesus' hand on the cross is pierced by a nail. I actually, so the first one I showed you, I painted in, I think it was 2010. This one I painted in 2020, so, uh, or no, 2019. So over the years, I, I was able to actually handle doing this, but it was still, it was emotional for me, even just painting um, on a canvas as I thought of what it all meant. Um, so the hand with the nail in it, it's, it's actually breaking through the veil that's what the blue and red is, um, the veil of the temple. And then the fire is the, um, the Holy Spirit and the, the burning up of an offering and a sacrifice that Jesus was for us. So his outstretched hand in the clouds is both about his resurrection and his return in the clouds to bring us fully into his presence in the future. And there's a little scar on the palm um, where the nail was, which is sort of my, not just my trademark thing, but um, many times the hands of Jesus are represented with a scar in the palm. So the Holy Spirit image took me a long time to get to. I really wrestled and prayed through this one because I, I just wasn't sure how to do it. Um, so one morning I was laying on the floor in my bedroom, uh, on the foam roller doing exercises. And I looked up at the ceiling and there was a dove made of light on the ceiling. And I think I'd been thinking about the painting at the time and there was this dove. So I took a picture of it and here it is. That was on my ceiling. I haven't seen it ever again. But while I was in the midst of trying to figure out how to paint this, this dove showed up and I knew God was saying, keep going. Here's my little bit of encouragement. So first I painted a dove and it still wasn't the right thing. Uh, so I started doing some um, 
research thinking about what other imagery was used for the Holy Spirit in scripture. And uh, oil and fire were two of the images. And then I realized that the Holy Spirit fills our hearts with the oil of his presence, like oil poured into a jar in ancient Israel. My research led me to some jars that were shaped similarly to the human heart. So I created an oil amphora with the colors and arteries and veins of a human heart to complete the image. If you look closely, you can vaguely see the white wisps of dove wings still behind. I think I could do a little pointer and show you. Um, so uh, right here, that's the remnant of the dove's wings. So the dove is still there, but it's, it's subtle. You have to know to look for it. And when I was, I did a practice run through with some friends and um, one of them said, oh, and there's actually the silhouette of a person on it right here, which I didn't, I didn't know I was doing that, but uh, God often surprises me with different things that I didn't know. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that came together uh, in this Holy Spirit image. So I will now show you the, um, all of it put together. And you can see how they kind of flow together. And then um, when I was practicing on my daughter who lives in California, she and her roommate noticed that there's a dove right here. So like the beak and the head and then the wings even kind of flow out here. So it all fl flows together, ties together. And uh, it, some of it really surprised me. Um, so in summary of this one, um, I carried the fire, the clouds, and the blue sky into each circle and uh, wanted to show the continuity and unity between them. Each person of the Godhead is unique, yet interconnected as a harmonious whole. So if you have any uh, questions, thoughts, comments, um, I'll leave this up and um, Jeremiah will call on you if you have any questions. Yeah, please, uh, you can either raise your hand and Anna, if you could uh, field any hands raised that I'm missing or or pose your question in chat, that would be great. And are you open to moderating that? Yeah, I have the chat open. Brilliant. Do you have a side shot of the picture, how they, how the panels no, fit together? I don't, I don't, but that's a really good idea. Yeah, they're each one is about maybe an inch and a half. Uh, in depth, so four and a half inches altogether. And is this hung in your home, or is it like where? Where is this painting right now? It's it's in our um, dining room. Yeah, that's really oh. cool. <laughs> so my husband brought up the painting. <laughs> so does that help? So it's like, yeah stacked like that. Yeah, almost all of these are just the ones I do, they're hanging in in our house. And Jenny, can you really give cool. a sense of, of how long it took to compose um, this triptych? Uh, is this, are we looking at the, the work of months here or years or? Probably months, I would say months. Yeah, this was a quick idea and then um yeah probably, yeah probably two to three months and you said that you found canvases that had beveled edges did you make them yourself or did you buy them i just i bought them i just ordered them yeah i haven't learned how to stretch canvases myself yet but um thankfully there are a lot of different shapes that are available to purchase and is it oil painting? Yes, it is oil painting. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. All right, 
time for the next one? I think so. Thank you, Jenny. Okay. So the next one is called I Am Incarnate. And this is where it began. Uh, this is my notebook. Um, I was in Vancouver, British Columbia. Dave, my husband, uh, was at a conference and I had a mini retreat uh, for myself in a hotel room. And I spent several hours just listening, praying, researching, jotting down notes as they came to me. Most of my creations aren't as involved as all of this, but this one took me from idea to completion about two years. Um, not that I was working on it the entire time, but it was more complex. And so I spent quite a bit of time um, developing it. So I just wanted to show you kind of how it, how it all started. And uh, most of them do, I'll, I'll write down just kind of a rough sketch and some notes what I wanna do. And then they usually change. So as you can see in the center, I was going to do the breastplate that um, Aaron wore. I started thinking maybe just Judah, the, um, the stone that represents Judah because Jesus is from the tribe of Judah and was our high priest. I wanted to show how he was our high priest, but he became the offering, the sacrifice himself. And I ended up discarding the idea because I spent uh, I spent hours of research on uh, Jewish websites learning which stones they would have been, what they would have looked like, what order they would have gone in, would they have been in birth order, grouped by who their mothers were, and there were different opinions, So, I, but I kind of got that figured out, and then I spent, I think, a total of about 12 hours trying to paint gemstones. I couldn't do it. They just looked cartoony or flat. So I totally scrapped that idea. I also on the bottom one tried doing something with the veil being ripped from top to bottom. And that one didn't work either. But then God led me to remember the uh, I am statements that Jesus made about himself in the book of John. And that gave me a framework to work from. So here's the way it actually turned out. Um, dip, kind of similar, but definitely different on each one. Um, this, this is my page here. One second. So I used the colors of blue and purple to show the piece. I wanted it to feel very peaceful, partly because we do have peace with God because of Jesus' sacrifice. We also, um, Jesus took on the human form um, peacefully. I, I, I just feel like it was not a fight for him to do it. Maybe it was, I don't know. But um, I just wanted to portray the peacefulness of of Jesus as I am. Uh, each of the statements in John tell of his deity that is without limits. He said, I am the living water, the light of the world, the bread of heaven, the vine, the good shepherd, and the door. However, when Jesus became incarnate, he took on the limitations of being a man. He chose to go from infinite to finite from without limit to bounded by his humanness. So we'll look at the individual paintings and then we'll come back to the whole so that you can see that. So this one is um, the living water. He washed the disciples' dirty feet in a small basin, even though he was living water. Living water is flowing, fresh, um, river, stream, lake, um, not something that is collected in a pitcher and poured into a bowl. But Jesus poured out his life and he loved as a servant. So I, I have a bowl and a pitcher from my grandma that I used as the, the model. I adapted it somewhat and then I added a towel. Most of what I paint, I 
um, I have to have a real thing to look at in order to copy. I can adapt it, but I still need an actual model. Um, I, I'm hoping more and more I'll learn to just, if I could just get what's actually in my head onto the canvas without having to set stuff up, it would be kind of cool. I'm not there yet. So the next one is um, the bread of heaven. And I used um, matzah and manna because when Jesus talks about uh, bread, that seems the most true to what he would have meant. Um, manna came down from the hand of God to provide for the Israelites in the desert. The people remembered the Passover by eating unleavened bread. Both of these bread metaphors are ultimately about Jesus as he was broken to provide for our spiritual sustenance. So I discovered a Jewish website with a recipe for matzah. I followed it. Um, it has to be prepared from start to finish in, I believe it's less than 16 minutes or 17 minutes so that it doesn't have a chance to even rise a, a little. So I set my timer and I, first batch I made was with gluten-free flour. It didn't work. So just in case you ever wanna make your own matzah, make sure you have the gluten flour because it will work a lot better. Second time around, it worked. I wanted to paint from what it probably would have looked like back in Jesus time, not the rolled out factory made matzah that you buy at the grocery store. So that's why I made it. And then the manna is actually coriander seed because it's described in, um, Exodus as being like coriander seed. So I bought coriander seed and um, then I got the little jar at a thrift shop. I had asked God, you know, could you just show me what I should use? And I went right to it and it was a great price. And um, so it all came together. And um, uh, let's see, I'll tell you about that later. So the next one is um, Jesus as light of the world. Although he was light of the world, he was contained in a body and most could not see his light or some even called it darkness. When our kids were younger, we'd have a Sabbath dinner every Saturday night and we always lit this oil lamp as part of our, um, our rhythm for the Saturday night celebrations. And when I lit it in my uh, art area where I paint, it set off the smoke detector. So um, I had to move my easel, move this, and, and totally set it up so that I didn't have to paint with the sound of alarms going off. But it worked. The next one is the vine. And Jesus, the true vine, was cut off from his father when he was crucified. So on the top left, you can see that the vine is cut. And I put just a little bit of red to represent the blood of, of being separated from his father. Uh, his blood became the wine of our salvation. I used photos from a friend's grapevine to work from, along with the silver chalice that I used in the first painting that I showed you. So I imagine I will use it in other paintings to come. I bought it at Value Village and uh, it will serve me well. Both the bread and the vine images include rocks as a subtle reference to Jesus being the rock of salvation and the stone of stumbling. And then the last one is actually kind of a combination of things. Uh, it's the good shepherd as represented by the staff, the lamb of God, who is also the shepherd and the door. According to the research I did, shepherds sleep at the opening to the sheepfold. And the sheep go in and they actually lay across it so that they are, the shepherd is literally the door. So the, the, the lamb is the shepherd is the door all in this. And in the, the flowers in the front are, um, are hyssop, uh, they're what hyssop flowers would look like because 
At Passover, they used hyssop branches to paint the blood on the door, and Jesus was offered the wine on a stalk of hyssop when he was crucified. So I included that as well. So I'll show you the whole thing one more time. Uh, once they were, all the images were completed, I needed to figure out how to get a cross-shaped frame uh, because they don't sell those at Michael's or Ben Franklin, which is where I often go for frames. So um, we were just getting to know Eric and Daniela Steinkamp over pizza. Uh, we'd gone out after church and I learned that he enjoyed doing uh, carpenter's work and building things with wood. So even though I barely knew him, I boldly asked, would you be willing to make a cross frame for me? And he willingly agreed. And so we went back and forth a couple of times and together came up with this frame. He suggested that we could find the wood for the frame because I wanted sort of an old rugged cross feel to it. He suggested going to the second use store in Seattle. So Dave and I trekked down there and pretty much went right to a specific piece of wood and brought it home. And when I showed it to Eric, I asked him what he thought the wood was used for. And he thought that it was probably old wooden flooring, which to me was very God inspired and God led because what better way to symbolize Jesus humility than with wood that had been trampled on and walked over by people's feet. So I love how God led me to the wood knowing its meaning when I had no idea. So this painting involved a lot more research and reworking than any I've done so far, but God led me through it faithfully and patiently as he taught me more deeply the impact Oh no, my, remind me later. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. Why is it doing this? Is your computer giving you updates? It is. I'm like, what uh -huh. is updating now? All right. We, we can't tell. It all looks great from our end. <laughs> okay. So you can still, I can't see what it's. Oh, just, no. It's We're just admiring your artwork. <laughs> okay. So I'm let me sorry, see Jen. if I could figure out how to pull this up again. There we go. Okay. Phew. All right. So I think that is actually, yes, that is the end of that one. So um, if there are any questions about this or whatever, now is a good time. Uh, Jenny, your work shows such a, a broad array of techniques. Uh, are there certain, so I have a friend who's a painter who loves painting skies but hates painting water <laughs> for all kinds of reasons. Are there, are there certain techniques you prefer over others or, and how have you acquired these? Has this been a process over time? Uh, I'd just love to hear more about the process. Yeah, so, we're seeing. I mean, um, these grapes look like grapes and it's just, yeah. for, for a non-artist, it's astonishing to see. Yeah, well, I I have I seem to have favorite topics that I often come back to. One of them is sheep, um, partly because of the imagery and partly just because they're they're very cute and fun to uh, to paint. So I do a lot of lambs. I've gone to farms when they have newborn lambs, just so I can take a whole bunch of pictures. Um, and hands, I really I I love painting hands, uh, but I do tend to have ideas that push me to paint things that I've never painted before. So I feel like I am almost always learning uh, and pushing and it makes it more difficult than it maybe needs to be because, you know, I've had to learn how to paint fire, learn how to paint water because what I want to paint involves that. I have ended up doing a lot of water paintings um, and people more People is a stretch, that's a challenge. Um, so yeah, it's just whatever it is. And I, the one of the Trinity, I think was a little more abstracty than I use, maybe not abstract, but a rep, not an actual scene than a lot of what I do. But, um, and I, I often, I, I tend towards wanting to be realistic, but it's also 
semi-impressionistic. So I want to explore a little more impressionist because I do like that style. So I want to go that way a little bit more. And then um, I've, I've just learned how to do pastels too. So I've tried all sorts of different, I've tried watercolors, doesn't work. Um, acrylics dry pretty quickly, but I've done murals on walls and I'm willing, I'm willing to tackle anything. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Other questions, Anna, from the floor? Yeah, Jonathan has his hand raised. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I probably have loads of questions because um, I did, I've got to, I had two pieces of art which were in last week's uh, fellowship hour. So ah. I, some people saw them, I don't know how many people saw them, um, but I could probably go and get one and show you in a bit. But I wanted to ask about um, how, obviously you get your creative inspiration through sort of like um, a, of, of some kind of sort of visual um, inspiration, if that's the right way, spiritual. Mm -hmm. And these two, these things come together. I wanted to ask, when you compose your pieces, do you normally start, when once you've sketched everything onto your canvas, do you start, I know this is probably from my perspective because I paint, but I paint the larger blocks of colour first and then work all the smaller details down. How do you work? Do you work that way or do you work smaller details larger to your block colour or block colour to smaller details? How do you, how does your process work? I typically go, it, it's in layers. So I'll do kind of the blocking in of the basic Color. Sometimes, well, sometimes I'll do, um, I do the drawing onto the canvas with, I, I transfer it, I draw it on paper, then I'll draw it, I'll trace over it onto the okay. canvas, then I do pen, then I'll do the whole thing, burnt umber, rub okay. off the highlights, then I pretty much do background to foreground, and I okay. have probably three levels of detailing that I go through. So it's, do you, um, yeah. Do you, for, for my, from what I tend to do myself is if I've got a particularly difficult piece that I'm painting or something that I want to see where there might be something amiss, I live with a painting for about a week or two weeks. And in that process time, what I tend to do is, um, take that painting back obviously with the paints that I've stored because I use acrylic acrylic is kind of my media um I store such large batches of color that I've got for specific pieces then I can touch them up and then put it back into position and then leave it again for a few days and as I'm living in our house I come across the painting you know going through to the kitchen or to the front door or wherever it is and I live with that so I can see how it would work in someone's home. Do you do anything like that where you leave it because it's something's, tr something's troubling you that it's not quite how you want it to be? Yes, I, I do tend to, I don't tend to be working on multiple paintings at a time that I trade off with. Usually I'm very focused on one, but I, I usually stop and let it sit just if I get stuck. You know, if I'm looking at something, it's not working. Even from if I paint one day to the next, I have fresh eyes to come back to it with. So um, it definitely needs to, to sit at least for a day or two. And if I get really stuck, I'll set it aside for a week and, and come back, maybe watch some more painting videos or something to help me. I'm currently doing one that's set in a desert for a, um, a book cover illustration. and I watched a bunch of videos on um, hiking in Israel just to get a feel for what the desert looked like. So sometimes I just need more information before I can proceed, and sometimes I need fresh eyes. So that's I think much. I think sometimes looking, like you say, at something that gives you that inspiration, that thing where you probably can't go, um, you know, or never been to. So you're kind of just seeking out things that will give you those uh, perspective of reality and then when you're painting that that's what you can 
-hmm. I guess I know the the phrase feel but you can't quite feel it but you almost can yes so therefore it gives you that point of perception so that when someone views that they get this feel that you've got yeah yeah exactly yes it's a process for sure they are they are truly amazing thank you so much thank you all right, we're ready to move on to the next one. Sounds grand. Thank you, Jen. Okay. So this is the last group and it's called Wrapped Cloth. And I was reading the gospel story either during Advent or Lent, I can't remember, but either way, I suddenly noticed the parallel between Mary wrapping Jesus in a cloth and placing him in the manger. And then Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus wrapping Jesus in strips of cloth and placing him in the tomb. And tying together, you know, Christmas and Lent and Easter all together. Um, as I pondered it further, I wondered if the cloth represented Jesus' humanity since the wrapping took place at his birth and again at his death. Then I realized that he left the burial cloth, left the burial cloth behind in the tomb when he was resurrected in his new body. He was shedding the limits of his human body. So all of those thoughts were just going through my mind. So I actually emailed Father Bruce to make sure that I was on track theologically. And um, he said, yep, go ahead. So I, um, I also shared these insights with my uh, two longtime Bible study friends. We've been together for, I think, 17 years. And they've walked me through a lot of, a lot of paintings that have spiritual meaning. And so I shared it with them. And a few days after I had shared it, one of them told me she'd been thinking about it a lot and kept thinking about Jesus washing the disciples' feet and how he wrapped himself in cloth at that time. So I decided to include that too. So that's how we ended up with four. Then I noticed a contrast. After Jesus was born and before he was buried, people wrapped him up. But when he prepared for washing, and set aside the grave clothes, he did the wrapping and unwrapping himself. So I put them across from each other. So the one other people did and the ones he did. The two actions are, or to say that he submitted to the care of people at the most vulnerable times of, of his life, at birth and at death. He wrapped himself while serving and unwrapped himself when coming back to life. So I will tell you the stories of each one as we did before. So um, this Mary placing uh, Jesus in the manger. As I researched mangers, I learned that most of them were actually carved from stone and weren't made of wood because in Israel, stone was a lot more plentiful than wood. Uh, another parallel Jesus was placed in a stone manger at the beginning and then placed in a stone tomb at the end of his life on earth. And according to what I read about tombs in ancient Israel, they were not just natural caves. They were actually um, carved out of the stone. Um, I'm always amazed to discover those specific details that God has tucked into the scriptures for us. So Father Aaron and Marissa had recently had Theodore, so I asked them to take a bunch of pictures of her um, placing the baby into a cradle, and they graciously did. So the actual background of this is a living room and a cradle, but um, they did that, and the love and tenderness that Marissa showed toward her little one in the photos transmitted well into the painting of Mary and Jesus. And when I paint a person to represent somebody, um, like to represent Jesus or Mary, I don't fuss a lot with trying to make them look exactly like themselves because they're not themselves. They're, they're representing somebody else, sort of like 
um, an icon, but not exactly. Um, so the next one is of um, Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And I asked our friend Jacob to pose for this. Um, the process, so this was in 2020 that I painted this. And so we did a virtual photo session. So I um, FaceTimed with his wife, Kelsey, and uh, asked her if she had things. So I would describe each thing and from the pitcher and bowl to the cloth and she'd say, oh, yep, I have one of those. Yep, I have that. So she got the props together. And um, my favorite memory was how Jacob kneeled down with the pitcher in his hand while his youngest daughter stared curiously at him from a chair just off screen. And I actually included that picture because it was just so cute to have her sitting there and she was watching the water and wondering what was going on. And I feel like even her being there impacted how he did it. There was a just a tenderness and a sweetness of uh, servanthood that, that he showed. So uh, Kelsey snapped the pictures with her phone while I said, ooh, could you do this angle, that angle? And uh, this one was actually the easiest one for me to paint from because it just came together really well. So this one was the hardest one for me to paint. Um, as I imagined how to set it up, because I get the idea and then I have to have the actual concrete thing. So I need to know how they work. I began to wonder about the details of his burial in a new way. Was he carried in men's arms to the tomb? Was he on a litter? Did they set the body on the floor or on a shelf? What did tombs look like in ancient Israel? Did they have to lean down to get into the tomb? I found a great YouTube video by a biblical scholar named Christopher Garnold Smith, who spent a lot of time in Israel. So I actually emailed him to ask my burning questions and was shocked because he actually replied the next day. And uh, according to what he said, they probably would have carried Jesus on a litter to give him um, honor, an honorary burial, even though it was hurried because of the sun setting, um, they would have found a way to do that. And he would have been placed on a shelf temporarily. That's the way they did it. They would put them on a shelf for a time, then they'd actually put them into like a tube that's carved in and wait for the body to decompose and be just bones. Then they would put the bones in a box and store it because they didn't have a lot of room. And so they had to sort of condense things. So first step would have just been a shelf normally, but because of the Sabbath day, um, Jesus definitely would have been placed on a shelf. So that helped me figure it out. They um, also, the entrance to the tomb was probably about four feet high. So they would have had to lean down to get in. After all that, I ended up not showing them actually walking into the tomb because it was a little tricky to get the right angle, but I still found it really interesting to get that information. So what I did was I created a body with a towel, a couple of towels, wrapped them with ace bandages, had some white fabric that I tore and wrapped around, and it was like from the waist up. And then, um, my helpful husband, Dave, posed for me. He set the body on a shelf in our dining room that has like this half wall. I put a whiteboard behind it. And then I'd say, okay, move to the left, move to the right. And so we imagined him putting, you know, what would it be like? And the setting doesn't look like what it was in my photo, but um, the tenderness with which Dave placed the body in uh, it just felt uh, like a really emotional thing as we did it. I added a beard, which he does not have. I added a turban as I painted. So it's not him. It doesn't really look like him, but it, it's representative of um, the men who buried Jesus. Uh, so I'll stop there. And then the next one is the empty cloth. And I really struggled how to do the lighting on this one. And what I did to, I took, I often paint from photos, 
if I could do it, if it's a still life, I'll paint from real life. But otherwise I take a lot of pictures just to get the right lighting and angle. And I, so I folded up some white cloth, put them in our shower because it had the kind of the right angles for the corner and uh, set up a lamp with an extension cord and took a bunch of pictures. And then after all that, I decided to actually just have the cloth sort of glow as if, uh, you know, because Jesus had just taken it off of his body when he was resurrected. So there probably was some, some power and light that was coming from it. So I painted it that way, set it on a table in my painting area and turned away. And then a few minutes later, I looked back and there was a beam of light shining through the window onto the cloth. And the beam of light actually bent around the front of the shelf, not like it would do in reality, but like it would do in the tomb. So I said out loud, okay, God, I'll include the beam of light. I called Dave in, I took a few pictures, and then I just got a paintbrush and I painted right over the beam of light exactly where it was. So I was just so touched that God would do that, that he would step in and um, show me how to make this uh, the way he wanted it to be. So as you can tell, God speaks to me in light um, through the dove, through this. There have been a few other times in my life where um, there was, I was in church before I even started painting like this and just was, I just say, God, I want to, I want to see you. And this beam of light just right in the front of the church. And I knew he had put it there for me. So God speaks to me through light. Um, so let's see, can I final? So I'll show you the whole thing put all together one more time. And um, I wanted to mount them on, I didn't wanna put them inside of anything. I wanted them to be on something that was wrapped with white cloth since that's the theme. And I um, contacted Eric because I know he knows how to make what I need. And so he just had some plywood, cut out a circle. I got linen from um, a store and tore it and wrapped it and attached it and then put the paintings on and trying to get them balanced. Ovals on a circle was a little tricky, but um, I think it works. And uh, then the photographer who, who did the, it was very difficult because she didn't, if she put it on white, the circle disappeared. If she put it on dark, they kind of got absorbed. So this is where I took this picture hanging up on the, the wall in our hallway. Um, so the final thing, and I'll let you, if anybody has any questions or anything at the end, I will hang out, but I wanted to share with you, um, I do have a website and I will put it in, let's see, how do I do this? Um, I don't know how to do it on chat. I think what I'll do is I'll do it in chat at the end once I'm done. Um, I have a website where all of these paintings are plus others that I've done. So I've got both the paintings and the write-ups that describe what they're about. There's a section that's called, if you click on the tab that says, um, spiritually based paintings, that's where these will be. I also have a bunch that are um, gifts that I've done for people, for weddings, for babies, for things like that. So you can look at those. If you want to look at my more current things like fresh off the easel, I have Instagram. You can check that out there. The, um, the website, it takes me a little while to get them posted, but on Instagram, it's, it's pretty fresh. And then if you wanted to contact me about anything, there's my email and I will stop that and then I can actually type it in. So if that's easier. Uh, Jenny, I just got it typed in for you. So it's <laughs> there on the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chat. So how do I enter something on chat? I'm trying to enter something. Oh, I, I, I got the website on chat for you, Jenny. You did already. That's what you said. We're all set. Thank uh -huh. you. Yeah, it's my joy. Uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Jenny. It's brilliant. Yes.
I have a question just about inspiration, Jenny. Does inspiration arrive all the time? Like, are you are there are there thousands of paintings or soon to be paintings uh, in your prayerful imagination? Do they arrive mainly on walks or in church or? Yeah, I'd love to hear more about just how these how these inspirations arrive to you. Um, there's a variety, but they usually are pretty instant. Um, just and sometimes there was one that I painted during or that I got the idea for during a um, Christmas Eve service. It's one of my earlier ones, and it was I, I was like, "Ooh, there's a painting coming. I, there's something," and then it just boom, there it was. So um, sometimes I just have this sense. Other times, if I've been studying, like next week, I'll be sharing one called Hands of Worship. That came out of a Bible study that we did on worship for months. And it just sort of was there. And then one morning at 4.30, I woke up and I was like, oh, oh, I know how to do this. So sometimes it's bubbling and growing, but the insight is almost always an aha. Um, often when I'm in church, like when we're singing, I do have, I have like a little screen show going through my head of images of the song. So I do kind of, I see things, they're not always for paintings, but I do often, I do have a lot of pictures going through my head. And can you give us a, a preview of what we can expect to find next week? Yes, so next week it'll be about our relationship with God and um, there are they're interactive things. So I've got one that's called God is our refuge. Another one in the storm, how Jesus reaches out to us in the midst of storms. There's another one um, uh, about kind of the motherly love of God for us. That's actually an illustration I'm doing for a book. There's another one about the fatherly love and um, someone from our church is actually the models for those. Um, so it's more, fewer group paintings, more individuals, um, a few groupy things. Another one about um, trust and illustrating our trust. So they're, they're a little more about interacting with God than who he is, even though they're a reflection of who he is. So similar, but, but different. Any other questions? Uh, Jenny, I, uh, this has been an illumination for me in a lot of ways. First, uh, just how you depict the spiritual imagination and what that looks like on a canvas has been so rich today. I had no idea that art could be such a collaborative experience um, in the way that you employ people around you. So uh, that's fantastic. You, and I tend to think of the kind of lone artist who's, you know, isolated in the hermitage or something, but I love this, I, this kind of commun the communal nature of your work. That's my favorite part. I cannot yeah. do this by myself. Yeah. It's always my family and certain, um, yeah, close friends, sometimes, sometimes strangers, but usually, yeah, yeah it's very much collaborative. And, and I feel like it's, um, the church at its best, mm -hmm. you know, using our different gifts, because a lot of my, the friends I consult with, they can't paint, mm -hmm. but they understand things about God, or they have gifts that are in other forms that are creative as well, that feed me. It's beautiful. Um, and then just the, the theological richness that is just imbued in your work. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I won't speak for everyone, but I, I was really blessed just to kind of hear the intentionality behind it, the prayerfulness, um, you know, they help me see them anew. So I think, and it's great to know that Theodore's in one of your paintings as well. <laughs> it doesn't really totally look like him, but. Uh, no, it's brilliant. It's, it's brilliant. The, the idea. And then I gave them a copy of the painting. So anybody who models for me, mm -hmm. I will do a print of the painting so that they can have a copy just as a thank you mm -hmm. for them being willing to, willing to pose for me. That's great. Well, my homework is to tour your website this week and come back next week. I invite all of you who are here to come back next week. Jenny, could you close us in a word of prayer? Sure. Thank you. Lord, we do praise you for your uh, hugeness and vastness, and yet how you love us so much. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to worship you through 
art, through music, through um, books, writing, um, talking, just so many different ways. Thank you for gifting your body to reflect you uh, in a more complete way and for giving us the, the skills for equipping us to do what you've called us to do. And so we pray your blessing in your presence on the people who are here this day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jenny Shute. Appreciate you. Thank you for coming. Yep. Thank you all, everyone. Have a good week. I'll see you next week. All right. Bye. Bye.